Welcome to our classic celebration. I am Pastor Michelle. I'm so glad that you have joined us today. We hope that you will connect. There are a couple easy ways to do that. One is to use the QR code that you'll see on your screen. You can let us know that you were here. Uh, if you have prayer requests, there's a place for that also. And if you're worshiping with us for the first time, uh, we hope that you'll text NEW to the number that you'll see on your screen. This can be a difficult season for some. And so our blue Christmas service that's coming up in about a week uh, will be digital this year. It's an opportunity, a time for us to uh, remember God's love in the midst of all things. It's a service of comfort and of peace. And if you're searching for that this year, we hope that you'll join us. During Advent, every year we take a miracle offering. It's a special offering that goes to uh, several ministry partners who are working every day, both locally and around the world, to make a difference in people's lives. Stay tuned for the very end of worship for a video that will introduce you or reintroduce you to these ministry partners. We're so glad that you've joined us for worship today. Welcome. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the loneliness of his servant. Surely, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And so we light the candle of peace, for true peace is found in justice, begun with Jesus, and this new world order, so that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Let us pray. Loving God, as this candle shines, may we rejoice in the warmth of your hope. Be grateful in the light of your generosity. Find you and Bless daily kindness, and may we proclaim our peace in Jesus Christ throughout this season of love and joy. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious and loving God, um, in this season of Advent especially, we come before you with grateful hearts, grateful uh, for all the ways that you work in the world grateful for the ways that you work in our lives. 
grateful for this season when we remember again uh, the most important way that you worked in the world when you sent Jesus to come and be among us. There are times in our lives uh, when things feel rocky and when we feel distant and when it is hard for us to feel or even know that peace exists. But we trust you, God, and we trust that your peace uh, never ends and it never fails and it is always offered to us. And so if we are in the midst of one of those difficult times, we pray that you would open us to know again the peace that you offer us, the peace that Jesus brought into the world. We know, God, that there are so many today uh, who are struggling in so many ways. And we don't always know how to respond or how to help. And so we ask that your spirit would go and be with them. We pray for healing for those who are ill. We pray for comfort for those who are grieving or struggling. We pray for wisdom for decisions. And we pray for assurance in our lives that you are with us in all things. In this time of worship, in this season of Advent, God, we pray that you would open our hearts to know you anew, that you would open us to experience and see you in the world around us in ways that we have missed. We pray that you would help us to continue to wait expectantly to celebrate Christmas, to remember what that means for the world and for us, to remember and to prepare to receive again your love given in a little boy. Be with us, God, in those things that bring us worry and anxiety. Be with us in all of our needs. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. has lifted so his eyes as flame. All hail St. Eagle, holy maiden Mary, most highly favored
Apparently, there is a list of things that people are afraid of. On that list is included flying, rejection, failure, success, finances, dark, light, other people, and death. Yet, we are in the season of Advent, the season where the angel appears and says, Fear not. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Today, we continue our series on Advent, and we are talking about the heart of Christmas. And we are now in week four, and we are talking about peace. Now, usually when we talk about peace, we think of it as the opposite of war. So peace is the absence of war. But from a biblical perspective, it's actually quite a bit more. The word peace in the Bible is the word shalom, which means peace and harmony, but also wholeness, completeness, prosperity and wealth, and tranquility. Interesting. Little word study on this. Now, in the Hebrew language, um, the roots of words are often three letters, three consonants. And then other um, vowels or consonants are added to make new words. But these words that have the same root are often related to each other. So let me give you some examples. These words are all the same word, the same root, as the word shalom, peace. Hasalem, which means it was worth it. Shulem, which means it was paid for. Meshulem, which means paid in advance. Mushlem, which means perfect. And shalem, which means whole. All these words, which sound kind of alike, are about peace at its core. Peace is more than, of course, the absence of war. It's something much bigger. And if you look at Semitic languages like Arabic and Hebrew and Aramaic, you'll see that the connection to this word shalom includes concepts like completeness, atonement, safety, security, and forgiveness. All these words are related to this concept this understanding of shalom, peace. One more piece to say. Um, Jesus, in his lifetime, he would have understood that really the whole way of God was the way of peace. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 17 says, Her ways, um, meaning the ways of God, are pleasant ways, and all her paths are shalom. So this way of God that is feminized here in the verse is about all of God's ways are ways of peace. All of God's ways are shalom. A biblical scholar put it with this way. He said the Torah, so this is the word for God's ways, is for the sake of the way of shalom. So for us as Christians, one of the things this means is that shalom, this concept, relates to the word and the concept of salvation. Both of them share this idea of wholeness, fullness, completeness. Shalom is the word that points to God's reconciliation in Jesus Christ, the peace that Jesus brings. In the New Testament, when we talk about shalom or we talk about salvation, we're talking about the reunion of God with all of the people through the work of Christ. Colossians puts it this way. It says, God was pleased through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Christ's blood shed on the cross. Peace is what I think we seek, yes, in the midst of war, but also in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of demanding times, in the midst of challenge, you know, Tuesday. 
first week in Advent, we talked about hope. And if you haven't watched that worship service, I invite you to, because I think hope is a really central concept that we talk about in this season. Um, and the big idea that week was that biblical hope is different than everyday hope. Everyday hope is uh, we hope things get better, that circumstances change, that time moves forward, that somehow things work themselves out. It's about hope in things, hope in circumstances, hope in what's going on. Biblical hope is different because biblical hope is about hope in a person, hope in Jesus and what he has done. So today we're going to hear a little bit more by looking at the Christmas story together. We've had three weeks of Isaiah, and today we turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. We're going to hear of the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and speaking about who Jesus would be. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Verses 46 through 56. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned home. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the angel says to not be afraid and then tells Mary who Jesus will be. The angel says, he will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Today, as we talk about this important concept of peace, I want you to see that the story of Jesus is not a warm and fuzzy Christmas story. It's actually about the fulfillment of God's promise this is a huge thing for us to see. And I think when we see it in context, it helps us understand that Christmas is kind of undersold these days. Christmas is often misunderstood. Christmas actually is something quite radical. Christmas is about the shalom 
the peace that God wants to bring us, the fulfillment that is his coming among us in Jesus. Christmas, from a biblical standpoint, is really about God not forgetting his promises to his people. Christmas is about a promise being realized. So, what is that promise? What is the promise in the scriptures? Well, the promise is the Messiah. The promise is that the Messiah would come, a new ruler with a new way, the way of peace. The one who would speak not peace to the oppressors, but peace for the people. The people who were suffering, the people who were crying out to God. This is who was to come, the fulfillment of the promise that the Messiah would come and bring a new way to the earth. For us to see all this, though, I think we have to know a little bit of history. It helps us to get kind of a context of what was going on. And so uh, let me introduce you or maybe reintroduce you to King Herod. King Herod is an important person in the story of Jesus, and he helps us understand what was going on at the time. Because for Mary, for Joseph, and for all those who lived at that time, this was not a time of peace. This was a time of great difficulty. Not if you were in power, of course, but if you were the everyday average person. Herod lived roughly 73 BCE to 4 BCE. BCE is just a more contemporary way of saying BC. What's interesting is Herod was quite a person. He was a king, and he was an amazing builder. He's known for some of the things he built, including the Herodium, which was his palace. Now, the thing I love about where he built his palace was he had this mountain, and it had the most beautiful view, but it was not the tallest mountain. So he went to where the tallest mountain was, and its view wasn't so good. So how he dealt with that was he had the land from that mountain brought over to his mountain to build it up so it would be the tallest of the mountains. Herod was a genius builder, and he had an elaborate bath system in his palace of hot and cold pools as well as saunas. And they believed that the first domed ceiling was in his palace as well. But that wasn't even the most amazing thing he built. Herod was also one of the builders of the temple. Now, the temple was already there, but what Herod did was he enlarged and embellished the temple. So the first temple in Jerusalem was built by King Solomon, and then the second temple was built by Hezekiah and Haggai. But it wasn't large enough, and so Herod, in true form, brought some more dirt in. You see how he did that in the first thing, too. And he made an encasement to expand the land. This, of course, was huge for the Jewish people. He became part of their history because of what he had done in increasing the temple. It was actually one of the marvels of the ancient world. But here's the thing. The temple, which was during Jesus' time, the temple Jesus would have referred to, it was destroyed later and no longer exists. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. Herod was a very troubled person. During his time, there were two branches of rule. There was the king, that was Herod, and then there was also the high priest. Now, in previous times, this had been one person, but in Herod's time, it was two people because Herod was not 100% Jewish, so he could not be the high priest. He could only be the king. And so Herod filled the role of the high priest with various people who he could control until his little brother-in-law became the high priest. Only 17 years old, Herod appointed him because Herod's wife, who was a Jewish princess, and what could be that family line, could be appointed to be a high priest. Her brother, 17 years old, was appointed, and he became very popular this upset Herod a lot, and Herod 
had him drown at the family pool party. Herod was an evil man. In the midst of all of his gifts for building, and if you go to Israel, you'll see many of them still today, he was a murderer. He murdered not only his brother-in-law, but his wife, his mother-in-law, and several of her sons. Anyone who got in the way, anyone who might take his power. My favorite quote about Herod comes from Holland Hendricks, who said, Herod the Great was probably one of the greatest kings of the post-biblical period in Israel, but you wouldn't want him to date your daughter. Herod's problem was not only with his family. Herod had lots of problems with the Jewish people, mostly because in all these building projects he was doing, they were funded by the people in the communities and by their labor, and they were getting tired and overtaxed. This was who was king during Mary's time. This is who they were all dealing with. And so this is why they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for God to send his person among them, who would be a very different kind of king. In our first week, we heard a little bit about what this king would be like, who the Messiah would be, when we looked at Isaiah 9, where it said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. So, a lot of history right there. But I think knowing that or remembering that, if you've heard it before, helps us understand the whole story here, that Christmas is about the fulfillment of this ancient promise, the promise that God had not forgotten his people, that a king like Herod would not reign, and that the disenfranchised and the lowly and those who suffer were beloved of God. God. So, what does all this mean for us? I mean, we're kind of a far distance from this ancient history. What does this say to us today? Well, I think today we are all still searching for peace, aren't we? Shalom, wholeness, completeness. So let me invite you to consider maybe this is the week where you and I, we are invited to look at peace, shalom in our own lives and to look at it in three directions. So the first direction is to consider our shalom with God. Do you have peace with God? Do you feel that you can trust him in the midst of life's circumstances? Is there anything right now that stands between you and God? God's peace is available to us all, and it's available to us all because of the work of Jesus what he has done, God among us, taking on the sins and the brokenness of the world. So anything that we have done is forgiven. God calls us home. God invites us to return to him. This is an important word for all of us. And if you feel distant from God, know that today he offers you his shalom his peace, his friendship. Second direction is to consider your shalom with others. Do you have peace with the people in your life? Are there things 
that have not been said that need to be said? Are there areas where you need some forgiveness, some relationships, some situations where there needs to be some forgiveness for your shalom with others? There's no time like the present. This is the time for us all to step into that shalom with God and with others, opening ourselves up to the wholeness that we seek in relationships with each other. And then the third direction for shalom is shalom with ourselves. We are called to be in peace in our own lives because when we are in peace in our own spirits, we sleep better, we're able to trust life more, we're able to find hope. Scripture says that God gives us perfect peace. And this is the peace that guards our hearts against anxiety and circumstances and sorrow. A favorite verse that talks about this is from Philippians 4 where it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Today, as we talk about peace, as we talk about shalom, I invite you to think of these three directions, to think about your peace with God, your peace with others, and your peace with yourself. And know that all of these are available to you because of what God has done for us in Jesus. This is a gift given to us in this season, not through works, not through trying harder, not through being better people, but through faith. Through saying to God, yeah, I'm tired of outrunning you. I want to come home. I want some peace. Maybe, just maybe, this is the moment. This is the moment where you hear that invitation to stop and to put aside whatever it is that stops you from knowing God's peace. Maybe this, my friends, is the moment where you embrace God's peace, where you receive God's shalom. Because when you do, you will know the heart of Christmas. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, we are grateful for your peace in our lives, your shalom that meets us and calls us to wholeness. You invite us to more than the lives we live. So often our lives are in turmoil, separated from you, from one another, from even ourselves. And in this moment, You invite us, you give us that wonderful invitation to step into your peace, to say, I'm tired of outrunning you, God. I'm tired of being on my own. I'm tired of trying to figure it out myself. Today, I want to come home. Today, I want your peace. So fill us and guide us and lead us all for your glory. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, the communion table is open to everyone. 
whether you're a member of this church, a member of another church, or a member of no church at all, we invite you to find simple elements so that you might celebrate communion with us. Bread or bread substitute, juice or juice substitute. And join with me in the great thanksgiving. You'll see your parts on the screen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we, your people, brought together, joined together in saying, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this gathered body of your church wherever we are and on these gifts of bread and cup. May we be a people whose desires are transformed by your Holy Spirit so we may live in the ways that lead to life. All of this we pray in the name of the one who calls us and invites us to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to take a moment and to share elements with those who are with you, remembering Christ's love for you.
doesn't take much to look around and see the ways that God is generous um, throughout all of history and even today. We have so many things to be thankful for, not just in this season of Advent, but every day, all year long. Uh, Thanks to your generosity in this last year, we have been able to continue to be active and relevant in ministry in new ways, in ways that have connected people to faith, in ways that have deepened people's faith. And we're looking forward to next year and all of the new ways that we'll be able to continue to do that work. If you've not yet filled out a pledge card for 2021, uh, there's a QR code on your screen. We appreciate your um, letting us know how you will financially partner with us in ministry next year. If you would like to give today, there's information also on your screen. Thank you for your faithful generosity. love this concept of peace, right? We all are seeking shalom, God, shalom in our lives, this, this wholeness, all of us. Know that it is here for you today, that God is just waiting for you to reach out and receive the gift that he has. So go this day to love and to serve the Lord and one another. Go from this time and be Christ church. There are many different reasons people become homeless, and there are many different circumstances and needs that bring people to Bridge to Home. Maybe they're low on money, out of food, and are looking for a warm meal. Maybe they're looking for a safe place to sleep for a few nights. Or maybe they've fallen on hard times and have found themselves without a roof over their heads or the means to find their way back to housing. this country, there's few shelter beds for families. And those shelters that do take families in, they split families up. What's unique about Family Promise is that we keep families together. You are making a huge difference in our lives and in the lives of uh, our students, our families, and the Chaco Center community. We invite everyone to come down and see the miracles that your faithfulness enables us to accomplish uh, with God's guidance and help. of the matter is is that women and girls are the most vulnerable people on the planet. They're the most people in poverty, they're the most people who are kept out of school, and it's really, really important um, to come alongside them. You cannot change the world. You cannot make the world better for anyone if you don't impact the lives of women and girls.